miracle of all time. The story of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing in human history more marvelous, more significant, more wonderful than this. So let's sing. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Turn to somebody before we sing and say good morning and God bless you. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. We stand and sing together. Christ is risen, hallelujah, risen, a victorious head, sing his praise, hallelujah, Christ is risen from the dead, grateful our hearts adore, as the light is open, bowing in Christ is risen, hallelujah, risen, victorious head, sing his praises, hallelujah, Christ is risen from the dead, Christ be seated as we pray. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we gather here at Scarborough this morning for our 5 a.m. service. We commemoratively gather as we remember your word, speaking of the resurrection as early, the first day of the week. We commemoratively gather because this is a big deal. It is worth not only remembering and celebrating, but commemorating. 
Because this is a big deal. God, the resurrection is a profound testimony of your power and your love. It's an important part of our life experience in reminding us of the power of God and the power of love and the power of good over evil. Paul says, oh God, that this act that you have done provides the basis for us being able to live another day. Because were it that there was no resurrection, waking up this morning would make no sense. Battling through the challenges of today would make no sense. Planning for a tomorrow will be an exercise in futility. Were it not for the resurrection, the stories of crime and violence would paralyze us to such inactivity because tomorrow cannot be anything but worse. But because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, my life is worth living just because he lives. So today we gather to worship, O oh God, and to celebrate you. We're able to say afresh with the songwriter, for you are great. You do miracles. You do things that blow our mind, that are outside of our realm of experience, regular experience and understanding. There is no one else like you. But the resurrection makes this worship such a profound experience because it enables us to appreciate that our God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There is... Nothing, oh God, cannot do. So as we worship this morning, take charge of everything said and done. Because it is to your honor and glory that we do this. God, our desire when we are finished here is not simply to be blessed, to be inspired, to be challenged. Our desire when we leave here is not simply to have had a Good time, felt good about it. But to be able to hear you satisfied, pleased. In fact, to be able to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because what we have done has brought you honor and glory. So God, take charge. This morning we pray. Amidst all our brokenness and failures, take charge. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father, hallowed be the kingdom come. I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. So we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom. Power and the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hmm. Brothers and sisters, as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ this morning, I want to just invite you to lean over to somebody and just share with somebody near to you the significance of the resurrection. For you, you know, we... We do this every year and we do this every Sunday, in fact. We remember the resurrection, we commemorate it. Um, we have different traditions we surround this thing with. We, um, but in the midst of all of that, there has to be something significant, something personal, something for you. When you think of the resurrection, that's what the resurrection means for you. So just take a moment, lean over to somebody and share 
what the resurrection means for you, what's its significance for you as an individual. Because this is a big deal. Even if you have to shift a little to talk to somebody. Or turn around or lean back or something. Talk to somebody. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead. And he is Lord. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's just sing that first one before we sing Lord I lift your name on high. Shall we stand and sing that together? He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord, every knee, every knee shall, and every tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord, He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and He is Lord. Every knee, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, one of the significant things about the resurrection is that some wicked people killed Jesus. You know that, right? Some wicked people killed Jesus. All he did was good, and they killed him. Imagine if the story ended in the tomb. Then it meant that the people who are making your life difficult because they're wicked, it meant that the people who do evil and wrong, it meant that the wicked people of our society will always win. 
You know that, right? But because of the resurrection, it reminds us that wicked people will not win. Are you sure you get that? The people who have made your life difficult because of bad mind and wickedness and deceit and evil, they will never have the last say. That's why Paul puts it this way. All things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And that's why it's so fascinating. Even in the, the, the entertainment movie make, makeup story industry, 99% of the times the story always ends with good triumphing over evil. And all of that was made possible because of the resurrection. That's why we can sing, he is Lord. I mean, he reigns, rules, he is in charge, he is risen from the dead and he is Lord. And whether it is the gunman or the thief man or the cantankerous neighbor, or if you are the cantankerous neighbor, Jesus, the, the song is saying, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he still run things. Amen? Amen? Let's sing that one more time. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen. Let's go. He is risen from the dead. And he is Lord, every knee, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm just going to bring the mic for 10 thank yous, because, because of what God has done, he has through Jesus Christ on the cross. He has made all of the stuff we could give God thanks for possible. And so, really, we just give God thanks for being alive. Being alive. Amen. For keeping us in good health and good strength and to come together to worship him this morning. Amen. My family. Amen. Huh? Sorry. For life, thank you. Yeah. Waking me up. <laughs> Waking her up, she said. <laughs> and she said it so quietly, it sounded like she's still struggling to get there. For traveling mercies to get here safely. Oh, for hearing this morning. Hearing, that sounded like it was the alarm you heard. For song mine. Song mine. Being able to fellowship with my Christian brothers for love amen he is risen all of this is possible why because because he's risen from the dead and he is Lord he is Lord of all thanking him for getting me here this morning when it seemed as though there was no transportation at all amen amen mm -hmm. And they seem as if there was none. God worked it out. Thank God for life. Thank God for life. Amen. For life and for life. Just a couple more. He is Lord. He is risen. For my family. Amen. For worship. For each and every one. Thank him for life. Thank him for all that he has brought me and my family to do. Over the past months. For good health. Good health. My job. Uh, present life. Patience to deal with this worldly mess and wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Patience to deal with this worldly mess and wisdom to know the difference. So for the blood that set us free. Dying for us so that we don't have to go on the cross. Amen. Health, strength, peace, and happiness. Health, strength, peace, and happiness. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay and from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Therefore, I do what? 
Lift your name on high. Let's sing to the glory of God. Oh, God, sure. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praise. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to say you came from heaven. You came from heaven. You way from the earth to the cross. My death to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave. One more time, Lord, I lift your name on. Lord, I love to sing your praise. I'm so glad. So glad you came to say You came from heaven To show the way from the earth to the cross My debt to pay from the cross to the grave From the grave to the sky, Lord I You came from heaven You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name one last time. You came, you came, you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on. Amen. Amen. Now, please be seated. We will have the scripture readings. The first of the reading is the, we sometimes refer to it as the historical reading. Note. It's the first reading, but this time it's not an Old Testament reading. It's from the book of Acts. And is Acts in the Old Testament or New Testament? Is Acts in the New Testament or the Old Testament? Oh, I, I wondered why I didn't get a vociferous response. And after the reading of the from Acts, we will have the tedium. I... I don't know if we can ask uh, Brother Alexander to help us in that one, because I know the tune we normally use here is one I'm less familiar with, tedium. And then we will go to the epistle and the gospel. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Good morning. We now turn our attention to the ministry of the word as we pray to collect together. God of life, who have, sorry, gave your only begotten son to the death of the cross and by his glorious resurrection have delivered us from the power of our enemies. Grant us so to die daily to sin that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his risen life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The first reading is taken from Acts chapter 10 verses 34 to 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. 
not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in, his, in him receive forgiveness of sin through his name. This is the word of the Lord. So we stand and we sing the, we praise the, O oh God, the tedium. And we 
upon us as all trust is in thee. O oh Lord, in thee have I trusted. Let me never be confounded. Amen. Please be seated. Now, I think I shared with you that as a young man, um, not very keen on singing anything in worship. Um, the tedium didn't inspire that appetite in me. I didn't, I wasn't keen on singing anything. So you can imagine if I wasn't keen on singing anything, the tedium would not have helped that cause. And, you know, with time, you know, and obviously having given my life to the Lord and having a great appreciation for both worship and um, the the, the significance, the historical significance of singing things like the psalm, and the tedium is not a psalm, but it is of that tradition. So I learned the tedium over time. You know, and obviously it came with time. And then I came to Scarborough and realized I have to learn the tedium again. Because <laughs> it's a slightly, it's a different tune. You know, there, there's a, another tune that we use for the tedium than what Scarborough would normally use. Um, so it, um, it makes me smile. I say, well, look at that. But I'll, I'll, I'll get in it. I'll get in it. <laughs> get in it. So we turn to the epistle and then the gospel. The epistle is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. The resurrection of Christ. It reads... Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand through, which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ had died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Christian friends. We stand for the reading of the gospel, which comes to us from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. Glory to your God entitled The Resurrection of Jesus. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. 
You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, oh, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the gospel of Christ. We remain standing and we sing, Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord, up from the grave he arose. Lo, in the Jesus, Jesus, Lord, and up from the grave he arose with a mighty from the dark domain, and he lives. Vainly they watched his bed. Vainly they, Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose. Oh, 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 One last time on the chorus. Up from the grave here. He arose. seated. Amen. A few, well, several years ago, I was invited to preach in Grenada for a convention, an annual convention the church has there. While there, they asked me to do a radio program. So I did the recording and it was aired Sunday. And the reflection was 
based on this Mark chapter 16, verse 3, who will rule with the stone? Today, I want us to reflect on that, but I remember, apparently, not apparently, I remember sharing on the radio that the stone must be removed. The stone was hindering progress. I don't remember all the other things I say, shared, but the question was who will roll away stone? The Sunday afternoon, that, that would have been broadcast Sunday morning, early morning. Sunday afternoon, we went to lunch by a member who was a politician. And as we sat there for lunch, he said, Rev, <coughs> I listened to you this morning on the radio, and I heard you calling for the removal of our prime minister. <laughs> so I am um, puzzled, but thankfully he had a bit of a smile on his face, so I, I had a feeling I wasn't in too much trouble. He said, yes, I heard you. Stone must be removed. I heard you, Rev. The stone is hindering progress. And after he milked that for as much as he could, he then informed us, because about a week or two before I got there, they had a major protest action. I think civil servants had protested, and there was the prime minister was unmoved by their demands and in intimate political circles they referred to him as Dr. Stone so a week or two after this major protest and Dr. Stone the Prime Minister was unmovable I went on radio to say the stone must be removed Tell you, I have always seemed to get myself in some kind of trouble. But that is good trouble. So this morning, I want us to reflect on that Mark 16.3. They had been saying to one another, that's the women referred to in verse 1, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James with Salome. They'd been saying to one another, who will roll away a stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Let us pray. <laughs> Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity this morning to wake and be out for this worship as we remember your resurrection. Pray, O oh God, that as we ponder on your word, that you will take charge. That your word will be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That very important biblical verse, which to many is the best summary of the Bible, establishes some very important principles. Firstly, that God loves. In fact, the nature of God's love is of such that the way Jesus speaks of it is to suggest that simply saying God loves doesn't even sound enough. It says God so loved. It is as if it is trying to give us the extent of God's love is not sufficiently captured in simply saying God loves the world. The love is of such an extent 
that he gave his only begotten son. I remember some years ago uh, when I was a younger man and really following uh, the music of the loving kind. A man named Michael Bolton, some of the others who are less young like myself would remember Michael Bolton. Some people say he was a white man with a soul, soul singer. He sang a song, I said I loved you but I lied. This is more than love I feel inside. It was as if he was saying, simply saying love was not enough. It didn't capture what this was. And so here in John 3.16, we hear God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. And then it says that that love, what it means is God does not want us to perish but to have everlasting life. And that means not just God giving us everlasting life to hang out somewhere forever. It's not just immortality. Is that God is saying, I love you so much that I want to spend eternity with you. Come on, you get that? Because everlasting life really means spending eternity with God. It's not immortality where God throws us somewhere on, a, on an abandoned island and we're able to live or plant us in a garden somewhere and just make sure we are all right. That's not what everlasting life is. If you remember in Genesis, God didn't just create a garden and dump human beings there. It says he was walking through the garden in the cool of the evening breeze. And not just walking because he wanted an evening stroll. It was walking as part of the intimacy and the, the communion with man. Don't you remember on that evening stroll who God was looking for? Who was he looking for? Adam and Eve. That's how we came up with the song, Adam in the Garden, hiding, hiding from the Lord. Adam, where art thou? Now you think of it. Isn't this what we tend to say when we are getting married? I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I see you as a person I could spend the rest of my life with. You know, you're the kind of person, you are the person, not just kind of person, that I want to spend all my years with. And, and on the other hand, you will talk to somebody who is not yet married and you will talk about the fact that 40 years from now you're waking up and the same person is next to you and so on and they put up their nose. So. You know why? Because they ain't find the person yet that they want to spend the rest of their life with. Hello, are you with me? And when they find the person they want to spend the rest of their life with, they want to wake up in the morning next to the person. Midday, they still want to wake up next to the person. Afternoon, they still want to wake up next to the person. Hello, are you with me? Yes. Mm. So that God's love is God saying, I want to spend eternity with you. And God's love is also saying, I don't want to see you spend eternity with Satan. <laughs> That's not good company. But for that to happen, something has to happen. What has to happen for that to happen? For us to spend eternity with God. John 3.16 says, what has to happen? Whosoever believes so that between God's love and our eternity is our belief, faith, our response to that love. Are you with me here? So that God loves and for us to access that love, we must believe or have faith in God. Are you with me there? What this John 3.16 also says is that 
Because of that love, God does something to enable, inspire, and facilitate the belief. What did he do? He gave his only begotten son. So that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. What this means, therefore, my brothers and sisters, is that God is invested in our eternity. God is invested in us, therefore, believing because God wants to spend eternity with us. Hear how John's gospel puts it. John chapter 20, 30 to 31. He says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. John puts an interesting perspective on the life and the ministry and the miracles of Jesus. He calls them signs. And John says, the reason Jesus did what he did was so that you and I could the word believe. believe in God through him and by believing we will have eternal life. So that John makes a profound point that saying that all that God did in the life and ministry of Jesus is so that you and I will come to believe. Now, I want you to understand this because sometimes our human arrogance causes us to miss it. Whether or not you or I believe, whether or not you or I have everlasting life, does that change the first part of that verse? No. John 3, 16? No. Are you hearing me? Yes. So in other words, whether or not we believe in Jesus, whether or not we believe in God, whether or not we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, whether or not we end up in hell or in heaven. It doesn't change the preliminary truth that God is a God who Love. loves. <laughs> so God's love is not defined or dependent on your reaction or mine. God's love is not determined by your situation or mine. Sometimes we forget that. Because when we are faced with difficult and challenging times, we, we believe the fact that we are going through a rough time or we have experienced tragedy or loss, that that implicates God's love. God's love is God's love. It never changes. And even if you think you are going through hell, that doesn't make God any less a God who loves. Some people haven't gotten that, you know. In fact, some people are so convinced that what we do and the outcome of our life determines God that they say there can be a hell. God can't send people to hell because if God sends people to hell, then God is not a loving God. And if there is a hell, then God is not a loving God. Well, first thing I always like to remind people, God ain't sending nobody else and it's you taking your bright self on good day. And so we begin to change our understandings of God based on what we think God should look like. And haven't you noticed that sometimes as we navigate life struggles and battles, we want to shape God in our own image and likeness. Yes. 
So if we don't think what God is and what God says is good and right, we change that to suit ourselves because God can't say such things. And we fail to realize whether we understand God, whether we accept God, whether we're going through good times or bad times, God will always be God. Our understanding or lack of it, our faith or lack of it, our experiences does not define God. Now, why is this significant? I want to take us to the tomb. The passage tells us that the women are going to the tomb. And they ask the question, who will roll away the stone? Why is that significant? You see, the stone, the stone was the barrier between them discovering the empty tomb and realizing there is nobody there. Are you getting that? The stone was that which would have inhibited them from seeing the empty tomb, the absent body of Jesus Christ, evidence that Jesus had risen. All right. Why is that significant? Because this is spin it around. If the stone wasn't removed... Does that mean that Jesus had not been raised from the dead? Huh? You're not sure. So you think the stone had to be removed for Jesus to be raised from the dead? Oh, okay. Just making sure. So the stone had nothing to do with the resurrection itself. That God's work of raising Jesus Christ from the dead was not hindered by the stone. The stone wasn't preventing God from doing God's work. The stone wasn't preventing Jesus from coming out. The stone wasn't hindering Jesus from resurrection. So the stone was more about the women and us than it was about God. You getting me there? So that the resurrection would have still been the resurrection, whether or not the stone was moved. God would have still been God, whether or not the stone was moved. Jesus would still have demonstrated that he's stronger than Satan and sin, whether or not the stone had been moved. The resurrection would still have been a fact of history, whether or not the stone was removed. So the removal of the stone was for us, for the woman, the women who went. It was to provide them and us with evidence. It was to enable us to see and discover the empty tomb because the empty tomb was, was that profound evidence along with what they would have experienced that Jesus was not dead, but he was alive. Whether we got the evidence or not, it didn't change the fact. The evidence was for us. And that is significant because here is a God who is constantly providing evidence of his love, of his power, of his grace, of his mercy. Here is a God who is constantly providing us with evidence to say, you believe me, you trust me, you put your trust in me, that I am God, that I am stronger than Satan and sin. Here is God constantly in our lives providing us with evidence for our benefit, not his. Sometimes, 
seems to me that we think that what God is doing among us is for God and not because of God's concern for us. Hello, are you with me? You see, we forget that, that the work that God is doing on earth in our presence, the, the things that God has been doing in our lives, it is God because of his love trying to reach us. It is God because of his concern for you and me trying to provide the opportunity and the evidence to stimulate us to faith. It is God who is constantly and consistently saying, Annette, I love you, trust me. Victor, I love you, trust me. Yosef, I love you, trust me. God is constantly, 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 continually providing evidence and opportunity for us to say, trust me. I love you, trust my love. Believe me, surrender to me. That's the God we serve. They didn't have to remove the stone. They didn't have to see an empty tomb. It doesn't change and wouldn't have changed God's power over death and sin. But because God is concerned and working for you and I to believe, the stone was removed. Wow. How many stones God is constantly removing in our lives? How many things have happened over the years and some we haven't even noticed where God is working in situations and circumstances and doing stuff in our life trying to nudge, provoke, and inspire us to trust him and to believe in him. How many of us have been paying attention to what God has been doing, the stones that God has been removing, the evidences that God has been providing, the awakening that God has been stirring, the moving that God has been doing around us, about us, just so we could say, he is Lord, he is risen from the dead, and he is my Lord. Some of us seem to go about our world and life clueless. The more God does, it seems the less we see. Ridiculously, sometimes when God provokes, prompts, provides evidence for us to trust him and to see him at work and to see his great work in our lives, we have found ways to dismiss it, to minimize it, to simplify it, to ignore it. Sometimes you, we use the very common, classical, you're lucky. How are lucky? And don't even realize we're giving credit where credit isn't due. Hello, are you with me? We have become, we have become so resistant and so blinded to the evidence of God in our lives and the work of God towards our belief and trust and our salvation. It has become so ridiculous now. I hope you church people don't buy over this stuff. A lot of modern way of talking and we borrow these things so easily. The universe did this. And the universe, the universe, haven't you been hearing how the universe is becoming very popular? The people are more and more giving the universe an energy. And if you all kinds of all kinds of elusive language we're using now, because we don't want to say God. Amen. Sometimes even church people you're hearing. Well, Rev, the universe really helped me out today. 
the universe brought us together. And we're working so hard not to see God saying, surrender to me and trust me. See my power, greatness, and love. Human beings continue to invest time and effort rather than to celebrate the greatness and the marvel and the evidence of God's creation to be able to say to us, look, there's no miracle there. All that is science. No, um, can't remember what the story was or the example was, but somebody was saying, I think it was the Red Sea, that there was a scientific explanation for the crossing of the Red Sea. I said, well, okay, I'm not denying that there may be a scientific explanation for how the water, quote-unquote, parted that allowed them to cross. I said, boy, but what a coincidence, eh? That just at the time Moses and the people of Israel were standing by the Red Sea. Just at that time when Moses raised up the stick. He just knew the right time to raise up the stick before the water to part. Me say, wow. Me say, all right. Well, if even that no no miracle, boy, Moses is a real smart man. I had to follow him. <laughs> Hello, are you with me? We try to find everywhere to take away the work of God in our lives and to miss the miracles and the evidences that God is doing to bring us to a place of humility and surrender. That's why I made the point earlier, if anybody goes, hell, God don't send you, you take your bright self and go. You know why? Because in every single person's life, God has been rolling away stones. But if we notice, if we take time to notice, God has been working in your life trying to provide evidence and opportunity for you to see how he loves you and see what he wants and call on you to surrender and call on you to forgive. God has been constantly at work saying, surrender your life. Look, you can trust me with it. You know, that's why sometimes we go through some real tragedies in our life. Because sometimes God realize if you're not learn so, and if you ain't see me in this way, maybe you're going to see me in this way. Hello, are you with me? Sometimes it's God still working. If you're going through a rough and tough time and things don't seem to be making sense, pay attention. This may also be God saying, ah, I'm glad you noticed you can't run your life. I'm glad you noticed that the things you've been trusted, trusting don't work. I'm glad you noticed that life is falling apart. Well, now watch me. Surrender to me. Give your life to me. Sometimes we don't realize that the pressures and problems and the failures is also God trying to remove stones to get us to a place where we can surrender our lives to him. Sometimes when God is trying to remove the stones so that we could see his power and his love, we're running behind the stone and holding on still. One thing I'm certain of. One thing I'm certain of is that God is invested in our salvation. Hello, are you with me? God is so invested in our salvation. Peter says this in 2 Peter 3, 9. Because people were complaining that, you know, since I small, they said Jesus is going to come again and I ain't seen no Jesus coming. You know, I let church people, you know, since in Jesus' day, they expect him to come again and he ain't coming. Peter said, even that is evidence of God's love and trying to reach us. Hear what Peter says. 
Peter says, look, it's not because God can't bring an end to this world right now, you know. I want you to get this, Peter says. He says, the two reasons you and I are still alive. So one of them is because God's time and our time are the same thing. So don't feel that God does operate with the same time schedule and minutes and hours mean the same thing to God as it means to us. You, you know, um, some years ago I used to watch this series called Flash. And Flash was this man who moves real fast. One of the interesting things is that when he moves real fast, you realize he could do a hundred things in one second because it's as if time slows down for him. So while for other people, let's say fixing this church will take them whole day, in less than a minute the church don't fix because for him, time means something different. For God, time ain't the same thing as us. But when we think that, oh my goodness, it's a whole year we have, for God it's not even a minute. So that Peter saying, for God, time is different, but he's something else more profound. He's saying, you know the reason you and I are still alive? He says, because God could done the world right now, you know. God could be finished with the world right now. Heaven ain't a man shortage or woman shortage. He's not desperate to say, well, all right, boy, we, we need, a, we have a quota. And we ain't reached the quota yet. No. The reason Peter says, you and I are still alive and the world has not yet come to an end, is because God loves you and me enough. To be giving us more time to fix our relationship with him. You hearing that? And that's profound. Because what Peter is saying is that if any of us die without fixing our relationship with God, without repentance, it's not because God didn't try. In fact, if there's anybody in the church here today, who has not truly surrendered your life to Christ. It's not because God ain't been trying. It's because you're still holding on on the stone. In fact, sometimes God trying to roll over the stone and we're forcing it back. Mm, no move it yet. No move it yet. If there is anybody today in on this day, the 31st of March 2024, in this Scarborough Chapel or anywhere in the world who has not given their life to Christ, it ain't God's fault. It's not for want of him not trying to reach us. Hmm. hmm. So, it seems for many of us, while, while the stone reflects God providing evidence to inspire belief, the stone also reflects the things that are seeking to inhibit, prevent us from in fact believing. The stone reflects and represents the things that are inhibiting us from truly noticing the majesty, the power, the love of God and believing in him. The stone reflects those things that are preventing and inhibiting us from truly surrendering because God is working. God is doing his work. And if the, even if the stone isn't removed, it isn't because God has not been working. But the stone can be representative of that barrier and barricade between us seeing and experiencing the wonderful work of God and believing in him and having life eternal. Interestingly enough, before this stone story, Ezekiel talks about stone in similar fashion. In Ezekiel 36, 25. Ezekiel says, 
God will give us a new heart and a new spirit you will put in us. And he will remove Ezekiel 36, 26. He will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Here Ezekiel uses the stone as symbolic as a, a, of a, a symbolic of an obstacle to faith, an obstacle to the transforming work of God in our lives. Ezekiel uses the stone in, in a similar fashion to Mark here because it isn't that God isn't God and it isn't that God isn't loving and kind but the stone is a barrier and an obstacle to faith and to surrendering and discovering the mercy and the love of God. So that Ezekiel says some of us have hearts of stone which prevents us from experiencing the transforming and cleansing work of God. <laughs> I wonder what we would identify as stones in our lives. What would you identify as stone? <laughs> Some things that have prevented you from truly surrendering to Jesus Christ. From experiencing the fullness of God's transformative work in your life. On what? Because hear this. If you are not truly saved, and I don't just mean I said qualified, there's not really a true saved and a false saved, but you have to say true and false because we have some wrong understandings of salvation that are not grounded in the word. If you're not truly surrendered to Jesus Christ, it isn't because God has not done his work. It's because there are stones that still need to be removed. Hello, are you with me here? If you are not saved, it's you is the problem. You are the problem, not God. If you are not saved, you are your worst enemy, not God. If you have not given your life to Jesus, it's nobody else's fault but yours. Because God is even this morning doing a work in your life. But the stones, the stones, the stones, the more God is trying to reveal and the more God is trying to do the stones, man. Stones. Haven't you seriously considered the stones, the things that continue to be there? They're moving and some of them, it look as if they're so immovable because that's why they say stone, because they're hardened in our lives. Stones. What kind of stone you have? And obviously, I ain't talking about God's stone. What is it? While God is working, is inhibiting our surrendering, our participating fully in the work of God, the transformative victory, overcoming, resurrecting work of God in our lives. While God is working, what is it have you allowed, and it's nobody else's fault, what is it you are allowing to inhibit the mighty, wonderful work of God possible in your life? <laughs> there are all kinds of stones. 
It's not sometimes there's not one stone. Sometimes there's so many stones. I always remember, I always remember, and I've shared with you before, the story of how they used to hunt monkeys in some place in Africa. Hunt a certain kind of monkeys. They said these monkeys love nuts. Or to put it better, they love nuts bad. So they said what they will do to catch these monkeys is they will have this box or cage fastened to the ground with a little slot at the top of the box and they'll put the nuts in the bottom of the cave, cage. And so the monkeys will come seeing the nuts. They'll put their hand, force their hand into the box and grab the nuts. But we have a problem. The fist folded can't come out. The hunter, once the monkey grabs the nuts, the hunter could have a carnival band making a procession to the cage and he'll still catch the monkey. He doesn't have to creep up quietly. He doesn't have to use stealth. And the only reason why he will still catch that monkey is that all the monkey needs to do to get away. Let go the nuts. And he pull out his hand. But that monkey, even as the hunter is approaching, will hold on to these nuts. Well, that's not even for life and death. That's for death. And all the monkey needs to do is let go the nuts. Some of us, that's what the stone is. Some things in our lives that we just would not allow God to move. They remain there to our own demise. We justify why the stone needs to still be there. We have all the excuses and reasons why the stone ain't moved yet and it can't move now. We have all the reasons why everybody got stone. So nothing is wrong if I still got stone there too. We find every bit of an explanation to have the stones that are inhibiting the great work of God in our lives to remain there. Some of us, the stones have prevented us from surrendering. And some of us, the stones have prevented us from growing. What is your stone? What is it in your life? continues to get between you and the great work of God that God can do. <laughs> the woman says, who will rule away the stone? What is interesting is that they were not expected to remove the stone. All they needed was to trust God to remove the stone. Interesting enough, they, they, they knew the stone needed to be removed, but they, they still went to the tomb. They knew they didn't have the capacity, but they still went to the tomb. And, and it is in that act of faith, still going to the tomb, that they discovered the stone removed and the tomb empty. You see, I believe that's kind of what um, Zechariah was saying. It's not by might, it's not by power, it's by my spirit. 
spirit, says the Lord. God doesn't expect us to move these stones. Lord. He expects us to trust him to move the stones. That's why Paul says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty divine power to pull down strongholds. But all we need to do is surrender. Come to God. Say, God, I see you. I hear you. I know you're reaching. I know you're trying. I know you're nudging. I know you. I know you. So just as I am, without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me. And that thou bids me come to the old Lamb of God, I come. God, I know this morning is you nudge me. I know last week was you calling my name. I know yesterday, it was you telling me, let go that stone, let me push it away, don't push back. I know last evening, I know last week, I really got a fair feeling, a sense that I need to be done with this foolishness. I need to let go, I need to move on. God, I know that was you. And all you want me to do is to let go and let you take over. God, I love this stone. I've always lived with this stone. It has always been there. What are going to do if the stone ain't move? If the stone remain, move, remove? I'm so accustomed to the stone being there. I don't know what I'll do without it. I'm so accustomed to living and I walk around the stone. In fact, I've, the stone, I decorate the stone. It looks so good there. It's as if it's going to look wrong if the stone removed. You know, some of us, the stones in our life, we have so decorated them stones and made them stones look good that the stone look like it belong. Some of us, the stones in our life, we have made it seem as if we can't, that the stone just have to be there. In fact, so many of us know the way we have defined ourselves, we have defined ourselves by the stone. And me? This is who I am with the stone. Without realizing the stone don't belong in your life. The other day I was sharing with a couple in counseling. I say, you know, sometimes marriage counseling, I say sometimes, you know, you hear people complain about marriage. And they think this marriage ain't working because they're losing themselves. I say, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, since, since I've gotten married, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I find that I'm losing myself, so I can't continue in this anymore. I say, what do you mean by that? I say, because, see, we borrow some of these fanciful ideas. See, because depending on what you're talking about, is a self you really need to lose. Hello? You see, sometimes we have defined ourselves by certain things that shouldn't be how we defined ourselves. We have allowed the stone to be so much a part that we, we paint it up, we decorate it, we do a nice mural with the stone and the cave around the stone. It looks like that's how our life is supposed to be. So I said, I said imagine a young man getting married and he's always talked flirtatiously with women. So that's just who I am. Since I get married, she's making noise because I just talk flirtatiously and I don't feel like myself anymore. Me say, well, that's a good thing. Hello, are you with me? A woman who says anything, anyhow, and don't care about the man's feeling or anybody's feeling. Now you're in marriage and you're forced to be a, a lot more conscious about what you say and how it impacts the next person. I'm losing myself because I have to calculate and evaluate before I talk. But that's a self to lose. Hello? So for many of us, we have allowed the rock, the stone, to be painted in our lives that we think that's who we ought to be. Stone ain't belong there. And unless you allow God to do what he can do and remove the stone, 
you cannot and will not spend eternity with him. And that ain't going to be nobody else's fault but yours. Don't blame the preacher. Don't blame the steward. Don't blame the wicked member. Don't blame the thief in pastor them. Don't blame the dead church. Don't blame the struggles and problems you're going through. Don't blame the wife that leave you or the husband that left you. Don't blame the politicians and them. If you do not surrender and allow God to do what God wants to do with your life and enable that relationship, you will have nobody to blame but yourself. So the question to who will roll away the stone was, they didn't realize God would roll away the stone. You just give him a chance to. You go to your tomb. You surrender the tomb. You walk towards him and say, God, I'm trusting you to move these stones. I'm just saying, yes, Lord, take away the stone. I don't know how things going to work out after this. I don't know how to, but that's not your job to know how God going to work things out in your life. All you need to do is allow him to move the stone. Let go the thing. Because as God is pushing, stop pushing back. Surrender and let God make you what God wants you to be so you'll be able to spend eternity with him. So I want to just pause for a moment and I ask you to use this quiet moment to think about some of the stones. Stones that have been inhibiting you surrendering to Jesus Christ or stones that have been inhibiting you growing in Christ. Now, me ain't going to know your stone and them, you know. Some people might know your stones, but what thing is certain, you got to own your own stone and them. You know, this morning I, I, I lapsed because I intended to bring a bag of stones. And part of what I intended to do was to give you an opportunity to take one of the stones from the bag and put the stone on the altar. Decide I'm going to let go the stone. I'm going to give over the stone, surrender the stone. God, you take the stone away from me. Because there's so many of us, we are not what God intends for our life. We're not where we're supposed to be. Our relationship with God is deficient and defective because of some stones that need to be moved. So take a moment and I want you to think about some stones that you, you need to bring to God and say, God, I'm I just letting go this stone here. I'm going to trust you to move it and enable me to see beauty and the victory of the empty tomb and enable me to participate in the most wonderful work of God the resurrection from death to new life so we're going to spend a moment in quietness
before we pray. Before we pray, I want to sing, for us to sing just as I am, the first verse, without one plea. For that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God. I just, I just let go, I come. While we sing, if anybody wants to stand and make a commitment to let go and let God move the stones, take control, if anybody wants to stand and surrender their lives to Christ and say, God, I know you have been trying to reach me, but I've been finding all the excuses and reasons to hold on to the stones rather than let go. God, I know you have been working, convicting, nudging. So today I am saying, Lord, I stop fighting back and I surrender. You may have given your life to Jesus Christ or made a decision before, but you know you have allowed some stones to inhibit, prevent, be an obstacle to what God really is calling you to be. And you may want to make a deliberate stand today and say, God, no more stones. I'm just surrendering everything to you. Because I want to be all that you have called me to be. It may be that you realize that you've been trying to fix the problems yourself and you, you intend to surrender but you're trying to fix rather than you just coming and trusting God giving him everything and committing surrendering to walk according to his word not your own dreams and plans and desires and ambitions so you may want to say well yes definitely just as I am I come so we're going to sing just the first verse and the chorus and as we sing, it's the opportunity, if you wish to stand, you can use this as an opportunity to say, yes, God, I hear you. And I'm just hearing you, but I come just as I am. Just as I am without one thee, for thy, thy blood was shed for me, and thy, thou bidst me come to We sing over that first verse. I forgot it doesn't have a chorus. Just as I am. Just as I am with all one plea. For that thy blood, uh, thy blood was shed for me. And that thou be Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we hear these three women asking about the problem of the stone. Who will roll away the stone? We realize, oh God, that behind that stone was evidence of the mighty work of the resurrection. And the opportunity for those women to see the evidence of your work so that they too can believe. 
God, I have no doubt that in our lives, you are constantly seeking to remove stones so that we will see and observe your love, your majesty, your power. But we also know, oh God, that while you are a God who is able and willing to move stones, we continue to either put them back or push back against them. We continue to create barriers and obstacles to faith and to surrendering to you rather than to just trust you, to let go and let you take control. God, there are many who are still half way there, quarter way there, three quarter way there, but just keeps allowing stones from enabling a full discovery and surrender to your love. And so, dear God, we thank you for that empty tomb that reminds us that Jesus is stronger than Satan and sin. Satan to Jesus must bow, therefore I triumph without and within. Jesus saves me now. We thank you for that empty tomb that allows us to sing hallelujah. He has won the victory. We thank you for that empty tomb that allows us to say because he is not dead, he's not in a tomb, he's alive, I can face tomorrow and my life is worth living just because he lives. Thank you, O oh God, that the stone was removed. And thank you for every stone removed in every life and heart in this church this morning. And I pray that our testimony will be one where we have no stones because by the love and grace and work of God, the stones have been removed. In Jesus' name we pray. Because he lives, as we prepare for the sacrament of Holy Communion, I can face tomorrow. God sent his son
Because he lives Then one day I'll cross the river I'll fight life's final war with me And then I'll step His way to victory I'll see the light of glory And I'll know He lives Because He lives I can pray We sing the last again. And then one day, day, I'll cross the river and fight. Life is worth, and life is worth because he lives. Amen. And life is worth living. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we are about to celebrate, commemorate, observe the sacrament of our Lord's Supper. God was willing to let go, to release, to give up his son. Just so that you and I could have an opportunity to spend eternity with him. When you consider the things we are not willing to let go, they pale in comparison to God's willingness to send his son. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is a good and pleasant thing. Joyful and salutary always and everywhere to give God thanks and praise. Lord God, ever living, ever blessed, almighty, all loving. Through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord, you created all things and you made us in your image. And when we had fallen into sin, you gave him to be our Savior, Jesus to be our Savior. He shared our human nature and lived a fully human life. He suffered rejection and condemnation. Good Friday, we remember that. And died on the cross. But you raised him up from the dead and you exalted him to the glory of your right hand where he reigns forever as priest, interceding, and as king who will judge. And he makes intercessions for us. In witness of his glory and honor, you poured out your Holy Spirit, building up many people into one body and enabling us to stand before you to sing your praises, celebrate your mighty acts, and making us living members of your holy church. And so with the angels and archangels, 
And with all the company of heaven, we join in the hymn of everlasting praise, saying together, Holy. Hosanna in the highest. As it is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe. And blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who, on the night which he was betrayed, he took bread into his holy hands, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it. Drink from it, all of you. Why? Because this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. And Christ will come again. Be ready for when he comes. Therefore, my Father, in obedience to your command, we do this, remembering what you have instructed and remembering him, praying that you will accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant, O oh God, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we who receive your gifts of bread and wine may share in the body and blood of Christ and become united with him. And as we offer ourselves to you as living sacrifice, we pray that you bring us with your whole creation to your heavenly kingdom. This we pray through Jesus Christ, O Lord, go with you, Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, your all honor and glory from all who dwell on earth and in heaven. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. Amen. The cup of blessing which we bless is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Amen. Oh, we are many. We are one body because we share this one loaf partake of the same drink. We continue in a prayer that is referred to as a prayer of humble access because it reminds us that we're not taking this, we, we, we didn't distribute this asking who is worthy. We distributed it to all to remind each and every one of us of the unconditional, undeserved love of God through Jesus Christ. So we pray the prayer together. Lord, we come to your table, trusting in your mercy not in any goodness of our own and not worthy to gather up the crumbs under your table. But it is your nature always to have mercy and on that we depend. So feed us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ, your son, that we may forever live in him and in us. Amen. My brothers and sisters, let us share together in the celebration of Jesus' death for our redemption. Let's remove the bread so we can share together the bread as we remember the body, broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was my intention, but I just remember. Um, so next week I will remember before I forget um, going forward, when we have communion, if we are you, when we are using the single cups, I will give the opportunity for persons who would want to come forward to the altar to share their communion at the altar to do so. Um, I forgot that this morning, but when we going forward, I know some persons would prefer to come forward, and so you come forward with your cup and you do you take and so forth. So we'll. We'll do that going forward for those who are so inclined. 
All right, so the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for you. We take and eat, feeding on him in our hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Uncover the cups. Blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which was shed for you and for me, we take and drink, and we're thankful. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood. What can make us whole again? Because we, we were broken. Nothing but the blood. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me bright as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We pray together. We thank you, Lord, that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet, prepared for all mankind. Amen. We invite children and young people to come forward. And I'm smiling, of course, as I speak. So, so the, chil the children and young people couldn't wake up this morning. All right. Well, you know, you know, times, times have changed. Eh? Um, oh, times have changed, you know. You remember long ago when not only that the parents would wake you up and you didn't have a say, you could vex all you want. They wake you up, you're coming out. Yes, come, come, the, the children. We have, I think, a little fellow there too as well. Yeah, yeah man, come. Um, remember long ago, not only did the parents make sure you get up, but it was far more common to get up at 5 and 6 o'clock. Now, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. If you give our children and young people a chance now, you know, 12 o'clock. Some of us who are less young, you remember when they used to say, if after, if sun, if you wake up um, after sun don't rise, is, is a sign of what? Laziness, son, is supposed to get you still in bed. Now, when, you, if you, when people hear that, they watch and laugh. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. We thank God for young people and our child here. Come, give me a big five, man. I'm happy. You, yeah, tell them you got up this morning. Yeah. Yeah, good. So it was a little difficult this morning. Was it difficult? Uh, Joshua, it was Joshua watching me, the boy. Nah. Well, I just want to go back home and sleep. Mm -hmm. All right, let's pray for them and bless them. Let's pray for them and bless them. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for our children and young people, for those present here with us this morning. We thank you for the fact that as times have changed, you provide us with the opportunity to navigate, to figure out how we must function in those changing times. God, what is wonderful is that your word will always be that point of reference to help us to figure out how to live, whether we live in a time where people waking up before six or we live in a time where people waking up after six as the norm your word still remains relevant to guide us as to how to live. I pray, O oh God, for these oh, young people and the child here at the altar and all our other young people and children. I pray that they will know without a doubt that your word is what must be a lamp to their feet and a light to their path. I pray that they will know without a doubt that the stones, the things in their life that seek to inhibit them surrendering and living for you can be removed. They just need to let go and let you take control. I pray, O oh God, that they will be testimonies of what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. I pray that they will be examples to other children and young people 
that living for God, living for God, is a living the testimony of the resurrection, that they will be a testimony to others that good will always win over evil, that even if evil and wrong and sin seems to have a celebratory day today, tomorrow will be the victory that we have in and through Jesus Christ. I pray that these young people and children will be able to wait for their victory. I pray against the impatience that often causes us to take things into our own hands, rather than to live that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength shall mount up with wings as eagles, run and not be weary, and walk and not faint. So God, I pray that they will truly wait on you, trust you, and we know that their tomorrow will be better than their today. In Jesus' name. Let's bless them together as we raise our hands towards them. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much as you return to your seats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of us remembered, man. And, and if you, when you wake up 6 o'clock and before 6, you had to sweep up yard and all kind of stuff you had to do before you go to school. Jog water. Well, we say jog in St. Vince mean to carry. Jog water and all them things that you had to go do. That's before you reach school. Go tie out, go cheap and all them kind of thing there. So you couldn't afford to be waking up 8 o'clock and them kind of time. Isn't that true? Yes, yeah, you can't wake up. You got to do all them things and still get ready for school. No, no, no. Children live in five-star hotel. Parents, if you give them a chance to carry breakfast in bed. Mm -hmm. All right, we have the notices by the store. I greet you all in the precious name of our risen Lord and Savior on this Easter Sunday, the festival of the resurrection. On this day, may the love and grace of Jesus Christ illuminate your life and those of your loved ones. Our preacher for today was our superintendent minister, Reverend Adolf. Reverend Adolf, we thank you for delivering such a spirit-filled message and we wish you God's continuous blessings. Special thanks are also extended to those who assisted in enriching our worship experience this morning. Heartfelt congratulations and blessings are extended to all those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries during the course of this week. Please remember the Circuit's Birthday Blessing Project continues and members are asked to contribute during the month of his or her birthday. Please collect your envelope from any congregational steward during your birth month and we'll now listen to the birthday and anniversary song. Happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. Every day of the year, may you find Jesus near. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. The best that you've ever had. Grant them the joy which brightens every sorrow. Grant them the peace which calms all earthly strife. And to life's day notices. The Circuit's Resources and Development Meeting will be held this Thursday, April 4th at 5 p.m. right here in the Scarborough Chapel. All relevant leaders and officers of the circuits and congregations are encouraged to make every effort to attend. This includes all ministers, circuit stewards, circuit accountants, elected members, one congregational steward from each congregation, and one representative from each congregation's resources and development committee. Upcoming joint pastoral and congregational council meetings this week, Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. will be Franklin Congregation, and next Sunday after worship, the Bethel Congregation will host theirs as well as the Olivet Congregation. Next Sunday as well at 5.15 p.m., 
will be Goodwoods. Another MCAP Farmers Market will be held next Friday, April 12th, from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Old Scarborough Methodist Compound. The participating congregations are Canaan Bonacord, Olivet, Castara, and Franklin. Please come out and support. A joint Circuit Pastoral Council and Circuit Council meeting will be held next Saturday, April 13th at 10 a.m. right here in the Scarborough Chapel. All relevant leaders and officers are encouraged to make every effort to attend. This includes all ministers and probationers, commissioned lay workers, circuit stewards, members of district conference com committees with membership in the circuit, local preachers, congregational stewards, class leaders and assistant class leaders, chairpersons and secretaries of circuit standing committees, and the elected representatives to the circuit councils. That is next Saturday, April 13th at 10 a.m. At this upcoming circuit council meeting, we will be electing circuit stewards. And while you may be aware that Sister Grace Dennis is eligible for election, Brother Yusuf Alexander is not eligible anymore. Anyone wishing to have more information on the responsibilities of the circuit steward can consult the MCCA constitution or speak with one of the current or past circuit stewards or Reverend Adolph Davis. The St. Lucia Circuit, as the organizing circuit for the District Proclamation Conference 2024, sends its greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This year's theme is Transformed to be Ambassadors, Shaping Christian Conscience for a New Caribbean. The conference takes place from Thursday, April 25th to Saturday, April 27th via Zoom. Some of the topics included are Strategies for Growth, a New Caribbean Church, Reimaging Our Methodist Christian Journey, and Youth Mentorship, a Call to Conscience. The registration link will be circulated. The Darlington family will be hosting a fundraising breakfast on Friday, April 26th from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. It takes place at the Marshalls Building, Picton Street, near Tambrin, and the ticket cost is only $50. The menu includes fried fish, smoked fish, ham, pumpkin choker, roast baked banana bread, chocolate tea, and many other tasty treats. Please come out and show your support. The Tobago Circuit's Aldersgate Convention will be held on May 19th at the Goodwood Secondary School from 9 a.m. It is set to be a day filled with glorious worship and praise, inclusive of a competition in the afternoon session. This is a competition in celebration of our joy in singing praises to our Lord, and it consists of four areas. The choirs. The test piece is hymn number 232 in the VIP, O Thou Who Camest From Above. Let us accept the challenge to present a well-known hymn by Charles Wesley in a new way. The second area, duets. Participants should be no more than 25 years, and any suitable piece can be chosen. The third area, solos. Participants should be no more than 25 years and any suitable piece can also be chosen. And the fourth area, choral speaking. This is a new category and the test piece is hymn number 526 of the VIP, where cross the crowded ways of life, verses one, two, five, and six. Participants can include any mix of age groups who are members of the congregation. Each congregation competing in the choir category are allowed to enter a maximum of two duets and two solos. Congregations that may not be able to compete in the choir category are allowed a maximum of three duets and three solos. The hope is that the congregations will encourage their young people to participate in these competitions. Prizes will be awarded to the winning congregations and a form for congregations to provide information to facilitate formatting of the program will be circulated in the next two weeks. At this time, heartfelt condolences are extended to all persons experiencing grief over the loss of a loved one. May their departed souls rest in eternal peace. The stewards will now wait on you for your tithes and offerings.
Lord, our rock and redeemer. Thank you that you are infinitely, consistently, and perfectly wise. Your word says that we will find joy in offering our time, talents, and money to meet the needs of others. Help us to give freely, sacrificially, and cheerfully towards the work of your kingdom. May you cause the seeds that we sow to grow into well-watered, fruitful trees of life. Lord, bless us and keep us. Make your face shine upon us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. brings us to the end of our notices. Thank you. Remain standing as we sing our hymn to close after the hymn, He Lives, He Lives. I would ask Sister Lorreen to pronounce the benediction because as we begin the hymn, I will be heading to Mount St. George. Um, also remember, um, we, we do have one of our members and a family that is in Morning, the Gopal family they would have and are na navigating a very tragic loss. Please remember them in prayer and um, and continue to lift them up in prayer. And if you can, you know, just send them a message, give them a call. Just so we you don't have to be able to say plenty things. Um, so it looks like some persons were not mindful of what I'm talking about as the the, the 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 body that was found in the car is a couple of days ago is is a member right here is the, right. so I didn't realize you were not aware. So please remember them in prayer. Please remember them in prayer. So let us pray and then we will sing. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, in the midst of life's tragedies, you remain a very present help in trouble. God, we lift up the Gopal family and all those who are dealing with loss, and going through the pains and the questions. God, we thank you for being a God who carries us through the roughest times of our life as the poetic song Footprints shares. God, we pray as well for those who are not well. Some among us have had to go in and out of hospital and are still in hospital. I pray for your healing hand. So God, we lift up all these situations knowing that the resurrected Lord and Savior enables us and them to be able to say because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Give them the strength, the courage, the faith, and all that they need to experience the victory that comes only in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He lives. He lives. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world.
let us pray. Yes, dear Father, we know that you live within our hearts. We want to thank you for the opportunity to come here early as it was this morning to celebrate your victory in the resurrection of Christ our Lord and our victory because we can look forward to eternal life. We thank you for this opportunity, dear God. We thank you for the worship experience we enjoyed. And we pray, dear Father, as we go out into the world again, that we remember to lay down our stones and not let them inhibit our eternal salvation. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated while we... We thank all of you for staying with us today and hope the service was a blessing as we look forward to the week ahead. So until then, be reminded that God's grace offers us fresh opportunities. Trust in God.